As political advisor to President Clinton, Paul Begala has given the president advice both on his NAFTA policy and his handling of Ross Perot. He joins us live from our Washington bureau. James Squires was spokesperson for then presidential candidate Ross Perot, now the former Chicago Tribune journalist, is a volunteer political advisor to Mr. Perot's organization, United We Stand America. He joins us from our affiliate, WBKO, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Jim, can you sort those numbers out for us a little bit? On the one hand, Mr. Perot's personal popularity seems to have taken a bad hit. On the other hand, doesn't seem to have had any impact on the NAFTA preference. Well, Ted, I think uh, all through Perot's time as a public figure, uh, his popularity has never been due to his uh, charm on television or his ability to deal uh, in the confrontational kind of TV we all deal in. It comes from his positions on the issues. And I think when he's right on an issue with his uh, constituency, they tend to stick with him no matter what. Now, he will go up and gain five or ten points and get up into the 30 percent or 35 percent popularity range. When that happens, he generally gets a very good uh, hard focus from the media in some fashion, either a press conference or a debate or something, and he will invariably do something that's politically incorrect or abrasive, and he'll uh, everyone buries him again. But I think the, the, the very fact that he is not politically popular is, is not that much concern to him, nor to the people who are backing him. Now, uh, Paul Begala, in point of fact, uh, the strategy, and I don't want to tell you what your strategy was, I hope you will tell us, but my sense is the strategy was in some way to hang that anti-NAFTA vote uh, on Ross Perot's shoulders and with his diminishing popularity, the end, uh, the, 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 the result you hoped for was that NAFTA would actually gain more support. Uh, first of all, is that uh, a correct analysis? Well, it, it is, but first let me say that uh, President Kennedy was right when he said that uh, victory has a thousand fathers and defeat is an orphan. Uh, this is actually a victory that was hatched by two, and that was Al Gore and Bill Clinton. Uh, the rest of us were either against it or not involved at all, and so they deserve the credit for this. Now, I think one of the effects that you will see, is not so much in public opinion polls, but on Capitol Hill. Those wavering members are going to have to ask themselves, if they're dangling off the edge of a cliff, who do they want holding on to the other end of that rope? H. Ross Perot or Bill Clinton? I think that's a pretty easy choice to make. Well, except that H. Ross Perot is not alone. I mean, he's got the labor unions in there with him, and there's, a, you know, there's, there, there's been some pretty nasty fighting on this one. Uh, and Mr. Perot made it clear in that debate, uh, in, in one of the tougher moments of the debate, uh, remember, we'll remember in November, uh, mm -hmm. and he was talking about next year's congressional elections, and I have a feeling that had some resonance up there on Capitol Hill, don't you? Oh, I think it did, but I think it had the, the resonance of a boomerang. I think it came back to hurt Mr. Perot. Uh, members of Congress don't like to be threatened, and uh, no one does in this world, and voters don't like to see some bully. The problem for members of Congress who are undecided now is that if they vote, decide to vote against NAFTA, they may be seen, perhaps unfairly, but they will be seen as caving in to a billionaire bully, uh, that Al Gore finally had the courage to stand up to. You know, Ted, the giant sucking sound that, that you've heard in Washington has been Republicans trying to suck up to, to Ross Perot. It took Al Gore and the Democrats to stand up to the guy. Jim Squires, uh, that, that clearly, uh, there's a little bit of wishful thinking there, but uh, see if you can parse it for us. Where does the wishful thinking stop and where does reality begin? Well, I think portraying uh, per Perot as some kind of a bully uh, is in the best interest of the administration because they were in a, in a defensive position of having to say, uh, Ross, we're going to get beat on NAFTA, and no one even went out and took on Ross Perot. So I think there was a political compulsion to go out there, and I think they went out there rather effectively. And, and using Al Gore was, a, I think, I did not agree with all the punditry that uh, that, that was a bad idea. I thought it would be effective. And it, and it was no surprise uh, to Mr. Perot what the strategy was. He was, as usual, just unwilling to do the kind of a preparation and make the kinds of adjustments that one has to do. He was up against one of the more skilled, best rehearsed, uh, and sincere uh, uh, people in politics. And it was a very effective uh, uh, taunting of Mr. Perot. I don't think the, the facts uh, or the, that we put on any great show of courage in, in that from the White House standpoint. I mean, they want you to believe that. But in fact, they went out there and uh, uh, 
taunted Perot about his son, uh, went right to his weak spots. He's very uh, uh, sensitive to allegations that he has personal interest in this or that he's in politics for some financial gain. All of those things were exactly what the Republicans used to, to really bash him pretty good back a year ago. So they simply used really hardball political tactics in an effort to damage uh, the head of a, of a political uh, movement in the country, which is really threatening to realign the parties and keep the pressure on them. I think it was more designed to, to damage Perot as a leader of that movement for the 94 elections than it was to win NAFTA. I don't think they changed the outcome of NAFTA one bit. We're, we're going to take a short break now. When we come back, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, from you, Jim Squires, uh, among the things you didn't mention was why it is that he is uh, so frequently so poorly prepared on specifics. And from you, Paul Begala, I'd like to hear what the White House strategy really was. We'll be back in a moment. points that were raised by Dave Broder and by Jim Squires, going after those hot buttons uh, with parole. Planned? Uh, yes, they were planned, but again, I, I am going to be <laughs> uncharacteristically uh, honest for a political consultant and tell you, it really was Bill Clinton and Al Gore's idea. I mean, Ted, you traveled with us in the campaign. There were times when the two of those guys would get in the back of the bus and plot the whole strategy and shoo the rest of us off the bus. Uh, this was one of those times in the Oval Office where it was just the two of them, and what they saw from the beginning was that the facts are on the side of the White House on this, on this issue. And, and the reason debate requires standing up to a bully who is using demagogic tactics of fear and intimidation. And you saw that, the whole world saw it the other night in the debate. But there wasn't a whole lot of reason debate that took place on, on, on that broadcast. There was a lot of needling uh, back and forth. There was a lot of curtness, uh, a certain degree of, of lack of politeness. Not a whole lot of substance in that debate. Take us. Take us back, if you will, then, to the degree that you know it, and I rather suspect you do. Uh, what, was the, what was the point in trying to get Mr. Perot's goat? Well, the, the point wasn't to get his goat. The point was to reveal that there's no, there's no there there. There's no substance behind uh, all of this rhetoric. I mean, as we say in Texas, it's all hat and no cattle. Uh, Al Gore used to be a reporter. Uh, he's gotten over that now, gotten a better line of work. But he also was a subcommittee chairman in the, in the House. He's used to grilling people uh, who don't perhaps want to show that they don't know all the facts. And so he was perfectly prepared and qualified to do it on his own. Which brings me back to the question, Jim Squires, that I, that I started to raise with you just before the break. This surely is a subject that Mr. Perot ought to know inside out by now. And yet whenever he is confronted with specific questions, uh, it's always one of these things, well, if I'd known you wanted it, I would have brought the papers. And why, doesn't he know, why doesn't he know the subject better by now? Well, you know, all of us who worked around him in 92 and since know that if his chances of being elected president are, are quite slim because he will not uh, go through the discipline of being coached and prepared for television appearances. He arrives at his position on issues on what he clearly believes to be the facts. And I must say the facts are not all that clear on NAFTA, and I, I don't think that the administration has the corner on the truth. And, and Mr. Perot came there prepared with what he believes were the facts. Uh, and there are very few in his uh, uh, repertoire. He thinks that they, it will not create the jobs. It will draw jobs into Mexico, uh, uh, the work there, and it uh, will not be an economic boom to America. He believes those things, and he has facts to back those up. But the idea that he needs to be isolated in a room uh, so he can't be helped by his aides is a joke. I mean, Mr. Perot does not take coaching. He does not have aides who prepare material for him. And if he listened to advice from people who know, he wouldn't get into this kind of trouble because he knew what was coming. He just doesn't think he's in a popularity contest, and so he's not going to play the game. In the minute and a half or so that we've got left, Paul, where does it, where does it go from here? I mean, is Perot now a side issue? Do you get back onto just strictly NAFTA and pork barrel up on Capitol Hill? Uh, well, I wouldn't say pork barrel. I'd say we're certainly going to go all out on the Hill and carry our message to them. 
And I think the fact that Mr. Perot has emerged as the discredited embodiment of opposition to NAFTA certainly helps the pro-NAFTA cause. So you want to keep waving his image around for the next week? Well, he's done a good job of that on his own. I, I understand, but to the degree that you can help him, you certainly will. Any member who votes for NAFTA knows that they're putting their, uh, who votes against NAFTA knows that they're putting their political future in the hands of Ross Perot. Jim Squires, a response to that particular point. I don't think that anyone is afraid of Ross Perot or that he's a bully. If the, if the congressmen don't vote for NAFTA, it's going to be because they're afraid of their constituency. And that's exactly what this political movement is about, for, for congressmen to feel the pressure of independent voters in their districts. Uh, and if it, this, this debate hadn't changed any votes on NAFTA, the people who are against it are still against it, and these guys are still short in the vote. So I, I think that what you're going to feel from him all the way through 94, 96, or as long as he has the energy and will and heart to go out and take this kind of abuse, he's going to keep the pressure on. All right, Jim Squires, Paul Begala, thank you both very much for joining us this evening. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. I'll be back.